This is what Sarah stood for. His life here in Alta California was largely to be an advocate for the rights of the Native Americans. Now, at this point, I think uh, as a moment of context, we have to uh, look at uh, uh, something else. And I always carry uh, one of these when I'm giving a talk because it's a very important thing. This is the uh, number one currency in the world, an American $20 bill. Whose image do you see on it? That of Andrew jo Jackson. Uh, what's Andrew Jackson's most famous aphorism? The only good Indian is a dead Indian. And Jackson acted on his words. The Trail of Tears was the equivalent of the Armenian genocide. It approaches the Holocaust in its intention, killing off people, killing off as many of the Cherokee, the Cree, the Creek, and the other peoples. The result of this, from the standpoint of white people, these were civilized tribes. As you know, Chief Sequoia even gave his Cherokee people workable alphabet. And Jackson's killing them off. Sarah and even the Soldados did not see the Native Americans in that light. They saw the Native Americans uh, from the standpoint of the Soldados as builders uh, and as people who uh, uh, would make uh, these missions as frontier institutions possible. Spain did not have enough soldiers to take over the lands that the English and the Russians had their eyes on just to the north of San Diego all the way up to the west coast of Canada and Alaska itself. The Russians were already in Alaska by this time, at least in the uh, Aleutian Island chain and about to take over Sitka. The Russians, uh, they later befriended many of the uh, Padres here in California with whom they had a great deal of trade uh, because the island of Sitka needed supplies, uh, it needed lots of uh, tallow uh, uh, for lubricant and also for burning, for cooking and such. It needed leather, uh, they needed uh, wine, they needed grain. <laughs> They needed olive oil for cooking. All of these things were supplied. And most of all, they could get from padres like uh, Father Martinez here at Mission San Luis Obispo, sea otter hides, which the Native Americans harvested off the coast. And if they took those back by way of China, they were worth a king's ransom. So there's this active trade going on. But the uh, Russians, uh, uh, amongst themselves, joke about the enslavement of the California Indians. Let me tell you how the Russians uh, dealt with the Inuit and other Native American tribes. The Inuits uh, and uh, other occupants of the Aleutian Islands would be kidnapped by Russian vessels. Uh, they would take only the men and boys, and they were told if they ever wanted to see their families again, they had to take their kayaks, their small canoes out, and harvest so many sea otter hides. If you fail to meet your quota, in effect, you'll never see your family again. Is that not slavery? And what Baranoff did uh, at Sitka when the Native Americans uh, on the island opposed Russian colonization, he ordered his very powerful ships, the uh, largest uh, gunships in the Pacific at that time, to bombard the island until there were no Indians left, as an example. And that's how the Russians treated Native Americans. Imperial mission was going to go on, missionaries or not. Uh, uh, the soldiers had their orders, and if necessary, uh, the soldiers would do exactly what the Russians did, and that's how the Russians later say the Franciscan Padres were far more cruel. Not only were they Roman Catholics, which meant they were schismatic sinners, but also they enslaved the Native Americans. Well, what were the Russians doing? What did Andrew Jackson do? You see, there, there are real villains out here. Sarah did not picture himself as a villain. He pictured himself as an intervener and savior of souls. And to him, uh, the, a living Native American was a priceless thing. The Native Americans were brought to the uh, California missions, uh, converted, and they were to become part of a community. The vision of this community was one uh, that lived truly communally. No one owned property. Uh, for some tribes, this was fine. For others, like the Chumash, where private property was uh, a well-instilled uh, 
uh, process, that was not such a good thing. But uh, uh, there weren't any anthropologists around in those days to explain it. Now, were they really slaves? Uh, they were fed, they were clothed, uh, they, uh, uh, no one had to spend an inordinately long time in the hunting and gathering community uh, during, uh, in preparation for the uh, fall harvest of acorns and such. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the males would have to be out hunting to dry meat or fishing to dry fee, uh, uh, fish uh, and shellfish for the winter. Uh, the women would be busily working. If you've ever seen the University of California Ag Extension film called Acorns, it shows the laborious process of making acorn meal, which uh, just starts with harvesting acorns, uh, drying them, shelling them, pounding the nuts into powder, and then washing it uh, to get all of the tannic acid out of it that was palatable that you could eat. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, workday for Native Americans seldom exceeded six hours. Uh, compare that with uh, free men in England during the Industrial Revolution with their uh, 13 and 14 hour shifts for just pennies a day. Uh, that's uh, quite a comparison. What about punishments? Well, uh, uh, punishments in the 18th century were violent. I described uh, the uh, beating people at the rack and how the guillotine was invented to uh, make execution uh, a little less painful. After the French Revolution, and during the Revolution, statues of saints, just as we're seeing now and throughout the United States, were being smashed and such. Uh, stained glass windows were destroyed. Uh, uh, all sorts of holy relics were uh, desecrated. Uh, and uh, at the end of the Revolution, a very powerful man, so powerful that one of my favorite restaurants in the Montmartre district of Paris is on uh, Avenue Joseph de Maistre. Joseph de Maistre wrote in, 17, in 1819, after the revolution, uh, that the only way we could have adequate rules to have public executions again in the most brutal way. Bring back the iron bar. Bring back the rack. This is the only way people will have the fear of God put into them. Did Sarah want that in California? No. He was constantly trying to get lesser punishments for Native Americans. When his dear friend, Father Jaime, uh, was brutally killed in an uprising uh, at Mission San Diego in 1775, uh, he writes the Viceroy, please do not execute these men for their deeds. They know not what they have done. Send them back to me in order that I might find out why they did this and bring them back to Christ. It strikes me as a rather interesting thing. People in the 18th century throughout the world, uh, uh, unless they were very rich or royalty or of the uh, uh, priestly class, uh, suffered immensely. There was no what we call agency, freedom. You did not have freedom to act. There wouldn't be a uh, United States of America if people hadn't left the old system to get land in North America where they could be relatively free of control. That became an American ethos. But to the degree that we have American exceptionalism, that's the way it is. And of course, when the North Americans came here, uh, what did they uh, need for, uh, to have total freedom, exterminate the Native Americans. The Spanish did not want to have that. Imper Spanish imperialism was going to happen no matter what. The American drive to the western lands, uh, the hunger for new lands, for new peoples, was not going to be satiated. These are forces in history that could not be controlled. Sarah clearly sees himself as an intervener, as someone who wants to uh, uh, do things differently to establish these ideal communities. And he tried to set examples for other padres. Unfortunately, some of his successors were not so holy. That's going to happen in any institution. The letter to the, uh, the op-ed piece to the Telegram Tribune said 25 lashes.
Every nation had whipping post in front of it. That is not true. Uh, there was a pedestal in front of Mission San Luis Obispo. You know what was on that pedestal? It was a fairly low pedestal. We still have part of the sundial in our uh, mission museum. People, uh, the public wanted to know what time of day it was. They went to the mission plaza to see it. Uh, no whipping post there. How brutal were, seven, were 25 lashes? Well, uh, generally they were restricted uh, to be done not with uh, uh, leather, uh, but a uh, soft rope, something that uh, uh, I regard as totally inhumane. Uh, and I can understand the resentment of the Native Americans, particularly the humiliation in front of your family of this happening. And uh, the mistreatment of Native Americans uh, did go on. The op-ed piece to the, uh, uh, to the Tribune newspaper said there were uprisings at every mission. Not true. There was not an uprising at Mission San Luis Obispo. And indeed, during the Chumash uprising of 1824, uh, there were, uh, uh, the, Father Martinez uh, uh, offered to send soldiers and Native Americans from here to help put down that rebellion. And the Native Americans evidently were going to be very willing accessories to this plan. Uh, that also tells me some. A whole issue of mistreatment at the missions also made uh, less credible by what happens at a number of the missions, most especially here at Mission San Luis Obispo, where during typhus epidemics and cholera epidemics uh, in the 1850s, as people rushed through seeking gold uh, in eastern California, and they would come through San Luis Obispo and uh, human waste would get into the creek, European diseases like cholera and typhus, to which the Native Americans had no immunities, would break out. Out, killing in one epidemic uh, 400 Native Americans. These people flocked back to the mission as they were dying. A wounded animal does not go back to an owner who mistreated him or her. A wounded animal will go off somewhere else, but these people came back to the mission. When I interviewed Native Americans at other missions, I found they had a very bipolar attachment to the missions. They knew the cruelty of the system. Uh, they did not entirely separate the, uh, most of the padres from that cruelty. But when they would speak of certain padres, they would isolate them and they would say, but this man was a santo, but that man was a santo. Just as I heard from the Native Americans in Queretaro, when as a boy I visited that mission and then uh, talked to men who were in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, who claimed that their grandparents knew Father Sarah with great pride. Uh, I don't know if they, that actually was true. Uh, chronologically, but uh, they were convinced of it, and they felt that Father Sarah was one of the best things that happened to him. Every age has its historical revision. I thought from the beginning that the Sarah statuary, uh, that the canonization would have bad effects. I understand why Pope Francis feels that Sarah deserved canonization from the standpoint of evangelization, which is a primary Christian duty. He certainly spent his life evangelizing people. But as a symbol, he's going to be much misunderstood, and indeed he's going to be an obstacle uh, for Native Americans to convert. It's wonderful to have a single figure that you can say is the cause of your misery, and no people on the face of the earth has had more misery with the exception of the enslaved Africans uh, who came to uh, North and South America. But no people has had a more miserable treatment uh, than the Native Americans. They have a lot to complain about. Uh, what I, I, I'm the historian for a very large tribe of Native Americans. What I ask of them if their anger is so great against Sarah that they have to violently uh, destroy these statues I would like to see them take their $20 bills out of their wallets and burn those also or turn them in for other denominations and not refuse to use them anymore. After all, the government uh, uh, seven years ago promised uh, that we would have uh, a different figure on that bill uh, and uh, it's never happened. Uh, so get going with that. Uh, but this has to run its course. 
And as Christ said, let the dead bury the dead. I am reminded uh, through my dear friend, uh, artist Paula Zima, who lives in, uh, uh, in uh, Santa, Fe, uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico now, but she once lived here. She did that statue of a small Native American boy sitting next to a bear at our mission plaza. Paula sent an image she had just painted, some uh, Catalans from Barcelona burying a mackerel. This is a ritual. It was first painted by Francisco Goya back uh, in the early 1800s. Uh, and it's about burying the past. Uh, and there is the mackerel about to be buried. Uh, he's about to be lowered into the, his grave. And there, somebody already has a shovel of earth to cover him with. And the look on his face, he's smiling. You can't bury the past. The statues of Sarah are gone. They'll be put in dark corners of museums. They'll be nearly forgotten. Uh, but aspects of Sarah will still be with us forever. Every time you turn on your faucet and get water in this Cadillac desert that we live in, we owe that to the example of the Spanish Franciscans who came here, who talked about reservoirs and built reservoirs and built aqueducts. The plants uh, that we depend on for California agriculture, the olive, the orange, the, the lemon, the pear, the almond, these were all brought to California by the Franciscans. They are living uh, images of that legacy, and we can't deny it. We need to have a new uh, way of coming together. And I suggest now that the statues are being removed, we concentrate on trying to work as a community again. The wonderful thing of Black Lives Matter has taught us that we're all part of a system that we have to regard one another's lives very, very carefully. They are precious. And unless we work together, we're going to work against ourselves and the enmity uh, will persist. It's a time to end it, and we, it's a time to look at the missions in a new light. As uh, a long, I think I was the president of the California Missions Association, now the California Missions Foundation, for the longest term that anyone served. I renewed every year uh, till I uh, maxed out. Uh, and uh, uh, my argument from the beginning is that we have to incorporate the Native American experience within the mission experience. It was not entirely an antagonistic process. We have to find those points where Native Americans and uh, uh, the Franciscans come together. The common enemy in many cases was a soldado, was a civilian settler. There was no syphilis in California until the De Anza expedition came into what is now the Santa Clara Valley. And syphilis spread like wildfire up and down uh, California, killing uh, tens of thousands of Native Americans. We find examples of that at burial sites at a time when, uh, unfortunately, we uh, disrespected Native American bones and studied them uh, instead. Uh, but those bones did reveal a terrible history. And we need to talk about these things. And we need to have Native American speakers uh, come in. We also have to, uh, need to hear from the Franciscan side. What were their goals? What would St. Francis say? What would Father Sarah say if he were here today and saw the mistakes? Today's Roman Catholic Church no longer permits missionization. Since the Vatican Council in the early 1960s, there's a whole different approach. You do not try to take away someone else's religion. If they have their own religion, you let them follow that path. This makes a world of difference. We need to, again, look in context. And when we look uh, at the face of Sarah, and we will continue to have some portraits of Sarah, maybe shown probably in a rather disclosed way. But when we look at the Sarah, we have to realize here is every man trying to be a good man in his time. And we can't take him out of his time. What happened, happened. We're trying to uh, bury the dead, but the dead is smiling at us as he does in Zoya and Polyzema's image because he can't be buried. He is still part of us today.